for joining us today at the World Captive Forum in this session entitled uh, Democratizing Self-Insurance in Asia. I'm Farah and I'm CEO of Labuan International Business and Financial Center Malaysia and I will be moderating this session. And it gives me now great pleasure to uh, introduce my panel. Uh, we have Frank Barron, Head of Risk Management International SOS, uh, George McGee, Managing Director Asia Pacific Captive Practice uh, Willis Towers Watson, Graham Clark, Chairman and CEO of Asia Affinity uh, Limited, Reginald Peacock, CEO, Singapore Branch and Head of Commercial Insurance Asia for Zurich. Thank you, gentlemen, for making the time to be with us today. And really, this is the first time I believe that uh, the World Captive Forum will be having a session and a panel on Asia. So, you know, sometimes uh, when we consider the, the, the issues and the challenges that the pandemic has brought to us, with us and thrown at us really. Um, we, let's not forget the, the, the added benefit of being able to now link to everyone and open up our worlds as it were, even as some of us, as you can see, are still stuck at home. So let's talk a little bit about Asia. Let's talk a little bit about captives and let's talk a little bit about the growth that we've seen and the growth we expect to see. Now, we're not speaking to the unconverted here when we tell you that the hardening market has created an immense opportunity for self-insurance vehicles. Um, at the same time, it's important to remember that on the back of this hardening market uh, comes with the growth potential of Asia hinged on very clear and solid uh, levers. First and foremost, our low base numbers. Out of the close to 7,000 captives globally, only two and a half percent are in Asia or you know, are Asian domiciled, right? So clearly there is a huge upside potential, especially when you take into consideration that the economic growth in Asia over the, la over the next, uh, I don't know, five, 10 years is bar none. So the IMF recently came out with an expected growth of 8.1% uh, for Asia in total in 2021. The closest competing region to that will be Latin America coming in at 4.1%. So clearly there is potential via economic growth, via the low base, via also, it's important to remember, the heightened awareness among risk managers um, with regards to self-insurance. Now you take all those and the hardening market, you take into the fact that Asia has a very young population you take, into, you take into consideration that Asia is very open to digitalization, which is something we'll talk a little bit about as well, digitalization of the whole structure. And what you have, some may argue, is a perfect storm for growth. Um, and really that is the, the premise of uh, the future growth for Asian captives. But let's go back a little bit. Let's go back and see, and, and, and I'd like to ask actually uh, George the first question. Um, if I may, and George is known as um, the leader, a leader in the captive practice in Asia. He's seen it grow over the last 30 years. And really the question to George is very simple. How have you seen it grow? And where do you think it's going to grow into? How, how do you think it's going to develop? Thanks, uh, Farah. I think what you're trying to say is that I'm very old and I've been doing this a very long time, but uh, you're being kind to me. Never. Would I dare? <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I, I came out here, what, 28 years ago. Um, we haven't seen an exponential growth in the number of captives formed by and out of Asia uh, over that time. I think we have seen a dramatic increase in the engagement of clients with captive solutions, captive techniques, um, uh, not necessarily leading to the incorporation of a, a captive as such. Uh, and if we look at what a, a captive is about, I mean, the basics of a captive is to provide a, a formal, licensed, regulated uh, home center for the risk strategy of a, a client, company or group. Uh, and it enables them to better manage and finance retained risk, but also provides access to a broader range of, of capacity from a broader market. Um, now, you can gain a lot of those benefits of captive type approach, the formality, the, 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 um, the structure, um, the, the analytical base of uh, uh, setting your funding for retained risk, et cetera, 
without necessarily needing to form a captive. And many companies in Asia have got insurance companies within their structures, got relationships with insurance groups. They have other ways that they may be able to achieve the, the uh, benefits of a, of a captive approach and technique without necessarily needing to set up a captive as such. So a lot of my time is spent advising those clients on how to do just that and how to work within their current structure without necessarily forming captive. Now, um, at the same time, um, that places captive on the agenda for clients mm -hmm. and the process of analyzing risk as risk as opposed to looking at your insurance lines that you conventionally purchase in the market has become much more accepted and much more common, common in Asia. And the work that Frank does through Perima in working with the risk management community within Asia, but also bringing in expertise from outside of Asia to help drive that, that, uh, that change throughout the industry uh, is, is key to this. So I think what we've seen is a, a change in the approach of clients to the way in which they assess risk, analyze risk, manage and finance it. The application of techniques which are common to captive insurance, but sometimes taking advantage of alternatives as to how they might structure that. Uh, also um, understanding that there are many uh, financial, regulatory and political obstacles in many countries in Asia to establishing an offshore captive insurance company. Uh, and it's, it's probably not, uh, uh, not a coincidence that the, the markets where we've seen most development of captive, uh, such as Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, are also captive domiciles, mm -hmm. as is China. Yeah. So we've seen one of the biggest developments we've seen is the development of the China domestic captive sector yes. based on the captive insurance uh, uh, regulation in China itself. Now, that, that's not something that will be attractive to uh, companies from outside of China. It's very much focused mm. on China for China, um, but, it, but it meets a need within China. Labuan yeah. meets a need within Malaysia and outside of Malaysia, as yes. does Singapore. Yes. Um, yes. So th those uh, the, the the development of those homes within Asia for clients mm. um, uh, have helped to address the regulatory and political obstacles in certain jurisdictions in the region, but in others it's still a, a major a major obstacle to going out and forming an offshore captive. But they're still getting the benefits of the techniques and the basic. Uh, purpose of captive, which is that formal analysis, financing of retain risk and access to markets. Yeah, so when you're looking at, I guess, a heightened understanding and need for risk management, uh, based on that, then as a segue to that is the exploration of self-insurance, and then maybe then into captives or the different types of captives, you know, the different types of self-insurance structures you may have. So definitely it shows a, a maturity in certain level of risk management expertise and discipline within the region, which al allows for some kind of a growth. And this brings us to Frank actually, and your work in Parima, Frank, in Asia. How do you see risk managers taking to owning a self-insurance vehicle. Let's forget about the, the, the word captive for the moment, you know, any self-insurance vehicle. Um, do you think there's an increase in understanding awareness? Do you think there's an increase in appetite? There is a, definitely an increase in appetite. Uh, unfortunately, we are still suffering from a lack of sophistication and seniority in the risk management community uh, to structure this conversation or debate internally. Uh, and, I truly, and I truly value the, the title you picked up, uh, Farah. It's not about democratization of captive, it's democratization of self-insurance. I think it is very important because what are we talking about? The pandemic is only highlighting the fact that management is on top of the agenda right now for boards and, and executive committees. I just want to make sure that risk managers or the members of parliament are properly equipped to structure the conversation internally because what we witnessed uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with George and others, uh, we, have been, we have been contacted by a few members uh, last year in a kind of a panic mode saying, uh, I have a four, 
can fix to structure a captive? How can I make it? And obviously, we, we told people, you can't do it this way. Uh, it is one tool. What is the very important to do right now is for you to structure and formalize a risk appetite conversation within your company. You know, what do I want to do? Because guess what? If you do not structure self-insurance, self-insurance is going to uh, damage you back because self-insurance will happen without you being aware of what is retained as risk with your company. Obviously, um, and, uh, and, and Reg is representing, does have the huge duty of representing the whole commercial insurance market. So brace for impact. Uh, the, the deep crisis we are in right now in the, in the commercial insurance market, uh, it's not just about price. It is today for me about uh, uh, the reduction of coverage, the reduction of capacity. Mm. Actually, uh, George alluded to uh, the fact that, let's say, when, you are, when you're in a mature insurance budding and risk financing structuring in your organization, you do think long-term relationship with carriers. You do things like manuscript form and customized coverage. Etc. Et to do things like global programs, uh, which are very complex uh, uh, structures to put in place. This is I'm not I'm not going to say that all of this is gone, but all of this has been severely impacted by the uh, the evolution of the insurance market. This is obviously fueling in the conversation about what should we do as a, as a corporation, as an organization. But here again, I do insist on one point: the the pandemic is giving us a strong momentum about risk. But the debate needs to happen now with the final decision makers in, in the whole organization about what is our risk appetite and what needs to be done to what I call uh, uh, how to implement a, a strategic risk financing. Captive can be part of it, but it's really about how, yes. much, how much risk appetite I want to have in my company and where do I go next to cover the financial consequences uh, of some of them. So that would be mm -hmm. my first. So yes, I'm seeing, uh, as mentioned by George, I'm seeing a lot of engagement, a lot of mm. conversations, but it's still, I would say, a little bit in a, in a kind of panic buy, uh, mm. uh, and it's still a panic mode. And uh, I, I'm, I think that we are still missing a very structured, uh, intelligent debate internally about what should be done. And uh, mm. uh, hopefully I will be, I will be challenged uh, and I will be... Uh, 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 yes, I, I will be uh, challenged by George and, and Graham and Reg about it. But my, uh, from where I am in my uh, conversations with uh, uh, members of Parima, uh, unfortunately, we are missing uh, some seniority in the in the task force or the or the project team in charge of it. I would like mm -hmm. to see the CFO being uh, truly involved and engaged because it is a strategic financing tool. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not just a, a let's say a a quick and dirty uh, fix of uh, my god my insurance is too expensive yeah yeah, yeah. but, but having said, yes Sorry. please Graham. frank i sort of going to ask a question do you think in general with your with your members there is a real understanding obviously of not just about risk and risk transfer but actually looking within organizations today of quantifying the risks to which they're exposed I think there's a big, uh, there's a huge issue in this in actually being able at the primary level to say yeah. what risks are we as an organization oh, yeah. exposed to. So I, I, I fully, I fully agree with you, Graham. I mean, uh, obviously among, among the almost 3000 uh, members of Parima, you have a mm. decent of them who are doing the right thing and who are quite sophisticated mm. and uh, in their approach. But, mm. but mm. for the rest of it, and, and actually, as you, as we all remember, the, the title of this session is democratization. So yeah. reaching out to the to the next year, the next year, obviously, yeah. um, and I, I and I would love to see the to get the feedback from Reg on this one. Yeah. Uh, you they buy insurance, for instance, they buy insurance based on capacity and mm. and and budget available, not really strictly strictly speaking linked to this is my appetite, yes. this is my risk right. exposure, and and I think that that's that's a very good point you are mentioning. When we when you talk about risk appetite, it's also about how much? How much is my risk? Uh, how big? How big is, is the risk exposure I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm faced with? How yeah. how expensive is it going to be to cover that risk? Right. So I guess this is a good time to ask Reg um, about this and about you know this increase in price and the sensitivity of Asians uh, to price hikes 
and the cost of managing that risk? Yeah, so um, I'm thinking in answer more directly to Frank's question, we, we you know, there's, there's a very famous account in Japan where, where um, they brought in a new risk manager and that new risk manager basically, first thing that he did was go and, and start appointing some international brokers to place different yeah. parts of his program. Um, and the, the, the premium spend went up significantly, but, but he internationalized the risk and suddenly they had access to earthquake capacity that they, they hadn't realized because they were badly informed was, was available. So, you know, if you loop that back into sort of captive, you know, one of the key sort of benefits of, of, of looking at captive or looking at alternative sort of risk financing is the internationalization of the placement. Um, mm -hmm. And in the major market, particularly Japan, that's been missing for many, many years. And, and we are seeing, and I worked in Japan for three years, you know, the, the, the international brokers are really growing their presence in that penetrating Japanese market quite extensively now. And following on from that will be the internationalization of the placements. Um, and following on from that will be, you know, much more um, uh, programs aligned to the risk appetite and of, of the clients. Um, you know, it, arguably clients have been very ill served um, in some markets historically. And, you know, captives or alternative risk transfers is just one way of sort of internationalizing or democratizing this whole process. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, Labon itself has seen such a tremendous growth in Jap Japanese uh, interest. Graham, maybe you want to talk us through the situation in Japan a little bit um, <laughs> and, and what, what you see in that space. Um, I well, also I wanted to talk to you. Sorry, just, just one last thing. Just wanted to talk to you if you could share with us a bit on the digitalization aspect of it as well. Yeah, let's put that into two, into two, into two parts. I mean, I think the um, for, for Japan, um, as always, until the government here started a new digital ministry three months ago, things had been working at a glacial pace. Um, but I think if you track back from Thailand and floods onwards, there's been a growing awareness of alternatives, alternative markets and alternative structures, and alternative kinds of capacity. Um, the um, interest level in Japan is significant. And it comes back to a point in one of the, uh, of the questions about the education. And that's in a way is what's been missing. There hasn't been the access to mediums in which people can explain what the options are. And I think that the, if anything, this is one country in Asia where people are exceptionally thorough in understanding their businesses. And they do it in, to the nth degree of detail um, and understand what, what risks they have. That then comes up the blank when they say, well, um, I'm sorry, this is the product that will solve that need. And often it isn't, or it leaves gaps or what have it. That's changing quite rapidly now. And we've been quite surprised. We've been running sort of, I guess, five years now, sort of seminars looking at really first to just to test the market, see what kind of interest there was. So we do a day in Tokyo, a day in Osaka. And we get over 100 now turning up each time, asking all kinds of questions, all kinds of businesses. And it was just extraordinary. And from that, the dialogue starts, which is why we've just done the PCC and uh, with Aaron Le Bois. But there is, there is, there is a, I think, a very big appetite in Japan um, for, for captives and alternate, and alternate solutions. And they're complex. The, the, the tax authorities here and the government are very open to setting aside large amounts of funding for contingencies and emergencies. This goes, with, this goes with the DNA in Japan because of the natural peril of the natural catastrophe aspects. Mm, so I think mm. there's a way you could be really innovative and do, some, and do creative things here. So I think from the Japan point of view, there is considerable opportunity. Uh, it just needs to be, it needs the education, it needs the engagement, and it needs yeah. time. Um, but I, yeah. so I think that part, that part is, is, is strong. The digital, the technology piece, I think is a great enabler for what we're discussing here today. Because if you, if we look back, you mean sorry, the, you mean in the democratization of self-insurance, yeah, in the, in right? the, so to, how technology is going to impact mm. this whole democratization process. You know, if we look at just the last twelve months, and you look at the what that has done to our taste and ability at, to create to work collaboratively, accessing mm. information and accessing people that we wouldn't have been able to do before. 
mm. plus this whole digital communication is changed. Mm. Every single aspect of our business, of the understanding of risk and the understanding of risk transfer is changing radically due to technology. Now that's whether you're looking at, you know, at a primary level, how you use sensors and IOT mm. or satellite data to track your tanker in the Middle East, whatever it is, right? That data is there, which empowers organizations and potentially the risk managers in a way they weren't before. Mm. Mm. And in turn, as you then go, go through that, you then have other risk managers today have access to online databases and online information. Yeah, through, through organizations also like Frank's that can help, help equip them far better to, to, ma to manage and understand risk. The impact goes beyond that. It goes, you look at distribution, the impact that, you know, that our old model of saying, I'm a direct carrier, I'm an agency carrier, I'm a broker, has been turned upside down. You've got in-path in booking, Skyscan is the next new, is the great distributor of a travel business, right? So yes. this whole world that we knew is upside down. Technology is selling nothing, but it is a massive enabler. It is if, an you look at, if you look at us as insurance businesses, how we process, mm. you know, we're, we're launching two blockchain businesses at the moment, just looking at how we get rid of Bordereau and automate paper. I'm not mm. doing that just for process. There's a number of reasons we're doing it. But the impact we have, I can now turn around and tell an insurer they can make money on a $10 policy. Mm. So all mm. of that, all of that, lab, not just labor cost, it's, it's all about the infrastructure with which you can, you can use to transfer risk. But is that. It's, it's, it's an amazing enabler. It allows, it uh, technology digitalization allows for collection of information, Correct. creates the opportunity to have wise risk management decisions, yep. um, and it reduces the cost. And, you know, if anybody will tell you, Asians are very cost sensitive. Yeah, so, it, has, it has the cost. And importantly, Farah, it also is a great tool for the regulators because it gives them complete transparency, transparency. on the entire transaction chain. Yeah. So I think even you know, at the IAIS level, this has been really adopted now as a way as how do we, how do we enable and empower regulators? So all of this, going back to Frank's pay and the point that George made at the beginning mm. about how this has changed over 20, 30, 20, 30 years, the technology mm. is a great enabler in this, in the fact that yeah. I think it can bring us all up to date and we can share data and share information in a much more cost-effective way. No, absolutely. And the thing, the thing is, right, when we talk about education, and this is something that Frank discussed earlier, when we talk about education, um, my personal view, and it's a little bit um, controversial maybe, uh, it's about always educating the risk managers, the, the what about the insurers and the brokers with regards to the self-insurance vehicle? I mean, could it be that there is a natural kink in the system because of the distribution network, because of the lack of information and the lack of transparency? Yeah. Um, does anybody want to take that question? Uh, if I may, the foundation. yeah, a couple so, of uh, a couple of comments, and and I, I will re respond to your specific question, but. I do enjoy challenging Graham on a regular basis, so I don't want to miss this opportunity. Uh, Good. Graham, ga Graham gave us a very, uh, a very rosy uh, uh, picture about uh, how digitalization may help because it's true that technology is an enabler. This mm -hmm. being said, we, we saw it in the commercial insurance market on the retail side, so the personal lines, a huge improvements in how digitalization can help. Still, mm -hmm. it to be seen when it comes to corporate risks and also and so on, because we are still dealing with uh, Excel files and stuff like that. So it is a, uh, it is actually, I, I think that my team, for instance, is quite advanced. We are doing a lot of uh, uh, what we call the API and Power BI, mm -hmm. so, so a dynamic uh, uh, dashboard and stuff like that. So where we, we plug into the, the data sources of our internally in our company to monitor what's happening for us in terms of risk and insurance yet to be seen uh, with the way we are collaborating with brokers and with insurers as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, you're right. I think that there is something to be, to be done. Definitely, this will help. But, uh, but I, I, I did not see yet the corporate space of the insurance market uh, going through a, a true digital revolution. When it comes mm -hmm. to how we work all together, and because it's a multi-party mm -hmm. party, uh, uh, place here. Uh, also, uh, just highlighting the fact that uh, 
I'm, I'm so happy to, uh, to, when I listen to Graham, to see that there is a, uh, a development of risk management and appetite and engaging uh, captives and, and sophisticated tools in Japan. Actually, this does mirror very well uh, something that I wanted to share with you. Uh, Japan is today the largest country for Parima. We have more mm -hmm. than 150 members there. So we, we are seeing here really a momentum about risk management and, tr and companies trying to do the right thing. Uh, so I think that is a, is a good element to it. Uh, uh, when it comes to... Um, uh, sorry, if I, you, were, you were asking the question related to... I'm, I'm missing the point right now. Sorry for that. No, no, that's fine. Uh, we talk about education and it's always about risk managers. But could it be that the other side, so brokers, insurers, well, need to understand it a bit better as well. Okay, yeah, sorry for that. But uh, yes, we are we are developing right now in 21 uh, what we call risk pitch uh, at, at, uh, at uh, Parima. So we are developing now tools and sessions to people to, uh, to uh, get uh, uh, tips about how to pitch things. So one of them mm. is around risk appetite, self-insurance, etc. This is targeted to members of, of Parima, but actually uh, one of the missing points is that uh, still debate, we are still debating about it at Parima. Should we open the session to uh, the market? Mm. That's, that's potentially a, an avenue for us to contemplate. But I'm also, uh, even if it's a bit more ambitious, I would like to invite our members to invite their CFOs and in all the people in the finance committee we are involved in this so because i think that there is also a disconnect uh mm. in terms of understanding at, at this level where the decision making is done so so yes definitely a, a good option for us to contemplate yeah george what are your thoughts about this this particular aspect about this innate um push and pull between self-insurance brokers insurers Um, well, the, the within Willis Towers Watson, we work. Mm. My unit works within the risk and analytics division of of WTW. So we begin from the standpoint of analysing clients' uh, exposures to risk. So we don't begin on a product basis. So county is not looked at as a product line. Mm. Uh, I think there is still a tendency in the industry to think in terms of product lines, property insurance, liability insurance, construction insurance, mm. rather than beginning from the standpoint of what is the risk that the client is exposed to and how can we most efficiently, mm. yeah, how can we most efficiently finance and manage that risk, whatever the category mm. is. Uh, and is it possible to package that up with a, a group of other risks and, mm. and uh, bring in multi-line uh, uh, to the equation? And then can we, uh, found that out over a number of years into the future yeah. to bring in multi-year yeah. and that, that you started to talk about multi-line multi-year and that's into the what's what we still call ART although yes. some people call captives ART as well which I don't quite yes. agree I think they're as conventional as you can get um, so so it's, it's about looking at the uh, uh, the exposures that the client has and trying to engage with the client in that conversation and that means from our side as the broker consultant we've got yeah. to be leading that conversation or at least ready to respond to that type of conversation rather than uh okay well this is what your property insurance will cost um and, and that is an education uh, and a and a, a cultural uh, uh need within our industry that we need to develop that so would, would you say it's very different in asia as opposed to other parts so let's say europe or the caribbean where you were before do you think there's a cultural issue here as well no I don't actually know. Um, I think, uh, firstly, I've been here so long that it's hard for me to compare it to <laughs> previous lives. You know, the, we were issuing policies in Latin when I was uh, when I was over there, so it's uh, it's a long time ago. But um, but no, I mean, the the, the there is an issue here. Uh, in <laughs> it's hard to talk in generalizations about Asia because yeah. Asia is not a place, it's not a culture. It's 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 a whole range. So we definitely have an issue in some areas where uh, even the largest clients are looking still on that product base and are just trying mm. to get the cheapest property insurance and the cheapest liability insurance and, and mm. trying to move them off that, that level of yeah. conversation is a challenge. But that's our responsibility. We're their risk advisor, their risk consultant. We have to yeah. lead them in that direction. Uh, yeah. And we are uh, certainly in my organization, we're taking that seriously. And that's the way that we try and approach these matters. Captive and my role as, as the captive head for the region 
is, mm. as I said earlier, it's about the techniques and the approaches. It's not trying to sell a captive. It doesn't matter to me if a client sets up a captive or not, as long as they're getting the solution that makes sense to them, we're providing it. Yeah. Um, for us, obviously, as Lab One, it does matter if they set up a captive or not. Uh, but the reason I personally am excited about captives is because we have a protected cell company structure that allows for a certain element of financial inclusion. I mean, you know, when, when we started this conversation, I was talking about eight and a half percent growth GDP. But, you know, if anybody's watched Crazy Rich Asians, you'll see that the disparity in Asia is, you know, uh, probably insurmountable. And whilst there's, there are more billionaires in Asia than probably anywhere else in the world, there are also very hungry children, uh, very poor people who have been completely devastated by cat loss. Um, and I really feel that there's an opportunity here via this PCC structure, um, added with a digitalization element that will actually kickstart this democratization of self-insurance, this ability to create uh, a, a safety net for everyone in Asia. And I wanted to talk to Graham a little bit about this and his project in Indonesia, um, which, which, which deals with this whole SDG, the financial inclusion bit, um, and a little bit of protection for cat loss as well, Graham. Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, Graham. Um, I think this is, this, is a, this is a subject that's close to my heart, so I'll try and keep it brief. Um, but I think the financial inclusion is actually Greg Case referred to it earlier on this year as the last great frontier in insurance. Mm. Uh, I'm inclined to agree with him because it's not, it, pre it involves a unique set of challenges. Mm. Um, the way it's been looked at now has been very much top down historically. Mm. Um, we're looking at sovereign, sovereign risk, sovereign pools as a way of trying to address you know, protect, protection for the vulnerable in their hours of need. We tend to work the other way. We'll look at what, what we call euphemistically the last mile, which is perhaps the most difficult. Um, but that way around, you need, it gives you an idea of where the need is at the, at the, gra at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. If we look at this in terms of um, not just need, and I, for me, there is no academic debate about the need. We mm -hmm. can all see what the need is. The, the challenge is how to create the demand. Mm. That's whether we're looking at that as a traditional insurance or the demand that the government may need to provide the financial inclusion. So mm. these are the these these are these are the real these are the real drivers. If we look, World Bank, the FINDEX is saying we're looking at something like 1.7, 1.8 billion people on the planet unbanked. A large yeah. proportion of those are our own backyard in Asia. When you start to dig through those numbers in a little more detail, there's some really interesting stuff that comes out. Of those two-thirds have got mobile phones. Mm. Two-thirds of that number only have primary education or less. So we're back to education with a capital E again, right mm. the way through. So this is not just a simple equation of how you, how you persuade insurance companies to sell products to the underserved. This is not a traditional insurance company market piece. Yeah. You know, if, you're a, if you're a heavy agency player, doing the micro channel as well is anathema. So yeah. I think that what this needs is an approach that looks at it absolutely inclusively, which is kind yeah. of what the theme of the IDF is, Insurance Development Forum, and trying to do this. This involves everybody from community associations, cooperatives, mutuals, insurers, governments, reinsurers, yeah. we're all in the game. Yeah. And it's about how you structure and how you find structures that work to accommodate mm. that interest. Mm. Within, yeah. within, Dealing at that grassroots piece and the cap and the captive right. structures and the cell captures are ideal vehicles. Already you're looking at it at a macro sovereign level. Yes. The macro sovereign level works at a national level. The question yes. is how far down do the funds go when you have the trouble? So, but between the two, you can get in, mm. you can get in, you can get engagement. So no, and, and and actually there there is history in in yep. this as well. I mean, like a, 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 relative, a fund structure, it's not dissimilar, right? So if you right. look at the security side, the fund structure, it's not dissimilar from a PCC. No. And obviously countries have come together uh, to issue bonds, raise money for mutual development. Correct. This is just the other side of it, which is risk that's being managed. Yeah. 
it's I think that it's 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 all about risk, but it's all about providing a transparency on the risk that hasn't existed historically. That's where the technology piece is really quite important because that can give you an aspect to this. I mean, I'll give you just an off the wall example um, where we've got an initiative underway, which we're we're doing with seaweed. I don't know seaweed, but I'll tell you I'll tell you about it some other time. And we're doing seaweed. Whether it's for putting a collection of farmers together in cooperatives, and we provide central protection on the group, which will then the cooperative will then reinsure, and we use we'll use a cell structure for doing that. Now that 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 mechanism works in a really interesting way because it can work for the personal lines aspect, mm. and the, the 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 cost of the cover is all paid for out of the product. So price per kilo includes so the consumer ultimate consumer of the product. Is paying for the farmer's protection and with that we start then to look at the cat aspects of it now yeah. there are plenty of there's plenty of capital out there that will fund working level build up of capital for reinsurance provided they can see the model is sustainable that yeah. one of the big big changes this last 12 months is the attitude of private capital to green and blue financing yeah. So this is, yeah. and all Either we're way. doing here is using the captive model and the captive structure and yeah. additional insurance distribution we know in a slightly more creative way to address need. So I think the yeah. potential is, yeah, is, is substantial. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, we're going to run out of time soon. Um, did any of the panelists have any parting thoughts, ideas? Uh, um, if, I, yes, if, I, if I may... If I may, uh, I mean, just a couple of things before the, the, the session ends, uh, I, will, I wanted to share. Um, uh, I think that right now, uh, unfortunately, the, the panel of uh, people we have here today does reflect a little bit of the lack of maturity of Asia Pac because, uh, I mean, no offense to me, to George, to Graham, and to Reg, we, we are not from Asia. And uh, yes. so it, it says something about the, the need to make sure that uh, uh, in terms of diversity and inclusion, we have the local people being on board and being sufficiently equipped and educated to sustain this session internally. So uh, a first concluding point I wanted to share with you. I think that when it comes to self-insurance, it needs to be seen as being strategic. It needs to be seen as long-term. It's not, again, a type of thing. And uh, it, you need the buy-in from your, from your top management, definitely. So I would, I would uh, really promote the idea that uh, take your time. I mean, do not lose your time at, uh, you have to trigger the debate now, mm -hmm. the conversation now, but take your time at making sure that you have the, your basics right. And part of the basics are the, the buy-in from the top and obviously a true understanding and alignment about the risk exposures of your organization. Um, there is another element that we did not uh, uh, touch on, which is for me very important. There is also here a very strong uh, opportunity uh, to include for risk managers the employee benefits uh, uh, agenda as well. I mean, the pandemic is also highlighting the need to be better at managing health risks related to employees, the duty of care and all these type of things. So employee benefits is as being a, a very efficient way for organization to retain ta talent, to, to attract talent and to provide yes. the duty of care to your employees. Uh, there is here for me a very strong uh, opportunity for people to develop the self-insurance conversation around employee benefits as well, which means also yes. that the risk manager needs to be equipped to deal with uh, uh, chief human resources officers as well. Mm. And maybe a, a very last point. You mentioned, uh, uh, you mentioned the, the, the need for the markets to support this. Uh, I would say that yes, but honestly, as, as a representative of uh, the risk management community, I think the burden is, is is mostly on us. We have as risk manager uh, to uh, to go for this fly for quality and sophistication internally. So it's it is first of all up to us. But I would then maybe challenge back or, or ask the question back to Reg uh, uh, how how the insurance market uh, mm -hmm. can can support this fly for quality and sophistication. Because if I'm if I'm being very honest with all of you, and obviously my comment does not apply to people like uh, experts like Graham, uh, George, or, or, or Reg, but uh, the market is structured based on the maturity of the market. And my point is to say that uh, if you uh, you have, let's say, very transactional clients, then you tend to be very transactional in the way you are dealing with them. So 
when it comes to something which is a bit more top level, a bit more, I would say, on a consulting basis, trying to help uh, to strategize and, and to have a sophisticated conversation, I think that we are still missing the, uh, a decent level of, uh, I would say, talents and expertise to support this. But again, I think that it's the, this flight for quality should start with us, but I would love to... Yeah, that's uh, so I agree 100% with you, Frank. So I've been in the region for a very long time, even longer than George, I think. Um, and what I've seen when I was a broker is that really the market wasn't ready to, to have these discussions. They hadn't invested in the talent. They hadn't got the ability to really work effectively. So even when you had the opportunity, it was very difficult to find a market. So when I joined Zurich, you know, that was one of the main reasons is that I knew that Zurich could do this stuff elsewhere. And I really wanted to make sure that we invested in that in Asia. And that's really happened. Firstly, the other thing that we talked about, you talked about the engagement of CFOs and HR, I 100% agree again. But the other thing is transparency. And we were looking at Asia and particularly Southeast Asia. Um, you know, a couple of features of the market here, it's, there's very limited retention. Many markets have large domestic insurance, limited retention. And there are joint venture structures. And how is that relevant to captives? And it comes to this transparency point, because captives, by engaging a captive in an arrangement, you bring transparency on the premiums, you bring transparency on the structure, the integrity and the security. Now, to our audience, um, I think this is relevant, right? Because a lot of them are based elsewhere in the world and they're investing into Asia. Um, and I think this is a very powerful sort of driver why you should be considering this um, and a lot of the investments take place as joint ventures and joint venture includes local partners mm -hmm. and therefore the whole transparency piece is very important so having a captive actually drives a huge amount of transparency into a relationship and then if you look at PCCs what I've also found is that that parent companies don't like to involve joint ventures in their existing captive because you know, it's a minority interest, et cetera, et cetera. But if you have a PCC, you get that arm's length and you can sort of, you can have a specific view on the, the joint venture concern. Um, and of course, finally, the access to global risk financing, which we've already discussed. But I guess the most important point for me from what Frank was saying is the engagement of the CFOs, whether that's a CFO here or elsewhere. Um, and in fact, our biggest captive that we've arranged um, or helped arrange in the region out of Hong Kong was 100% driven by the customer's CFO. Yep. Great. That's fantastic. We're, we're going to have to wrap up, uh, guys, because we've got three minutes left. Um, I just really want to thank you for sharing your insights and uh, for giving um, the conference a taste of Asia for the first time in their 30-year history. So thank you very, very much. Um, and that concludes our session today. Once again, my panel, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. Thank you.